I give you this moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin through your priesthood. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. According to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's classroom etiquette for ministry of the Holy Spirit of the Word of God. So I give you that moment. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all that your grace has provided us. We thank you, Father, for this Christmas season to be with our family and as Al taught in the first hour, the importance of ministry. You know, it's the greatest gift that we can give people this, this season is Christ. And for those who have Christ, a restored relationship I pray that would be our focus. pray today the Holy Spirit would minister the truth out of the six truly, truly saying of John 16 in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll open your Bibles to John, the 16th chapter. Looking at, at the Last Supper, which is chapter 13 through 17 of John. Jesus gave seven truly, truly, I say unto you statements, messianic doctrines. We've been doing a study through the gospel of John on uh, all of the truly, truly sayings of this new teaching technique of Jesus to introduce messianic doctrines that were very important to the Jews as to where they were going, and that is into the church age, the believers. And so I'm looking today, I'm looking at verses 16 through 22 as my text. Now, the, 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 we looked last week at the subject matter of John 16 is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The focus of, the, of this entire chapter, the entire chapter is on the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is coming. And he says, it won't come until I go. And so that's a big point. Uh, look at verse 7. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage because they've been upset. Look at John 14, 1, how upset they've been. In John 14, 1 through 4, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, and I will, I will also come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. And... You see, their hearts have been troubled. And they don't realize the advantages that are going to come to them by his departure. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. I wonder how many of us really understand what advantages we have because Christ, other than salvation... That he came into the world, died, was buried, and raised from the dead third day. Do we know what advantages we have? Listen to me. Not because he died, buried, and raised, but because he went back to the Father. See, that, that's a two-point mission here. There's a two-point mission here. One is why he came to the earth, and the other is why he went to heaven. That's a two-point mission. And if it's just about salvation, then you miss the advantage of him going back. And so the great ministry, the, one of the great advantages to him leaving is, and going back to the Father, is this great ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's what John 16 is all about. John 16. Now he starts this discussion in John 14 about the Holy Spirit. And then he carries it into 15, and he blows it out in 16. He talks a little bit about it in 14, 
a little bit about in 15, and then he gets on to it in chapter 16. Chapter 16 is well worth your read. I'm looking at one segment of it, verses 16 through 22, because I'm, I'm after, truly, truly, I say unto you. A little while, now he's into the little while with him. That's a time idea, isn't it? It's a time idea. And it's kind of an interesting because when he says a little while, he's talking about hours, not days. Literally, any, I mean, we know this from the study because we're, we're about to go, we're about to leave the, the Last Supper, go through trials and be crucified. We're talking about hours. When he says a little while, it's not years and months and days and weeks and that. It's hours. So that's interesting. A little while, you will no longer behold me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples, therefore, said one, to one another, what is, what is this that he's talking about? A little while and you will not behold me. And again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. See, they, they've connected this, which is really good. Usually they don't connect. Usually they're good connecting things on the spot. And they said, oh, I, I'm just having a little hard time ta understanding this. Verse 18. And so they were saying among themselves, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him. So he said to them, are you deliberating together about this? That I said a little while and you will not behold me. And again, a little while and you will see me. There's our truly, 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 truly. I say to you that you will weep and mourn, weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. How about that? You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. He gives an example of grief turned to joy. Grief turned to joy. Here's the example. Whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow. Because her hour has come, a little while, he's working on that little while. Because her hour has come, but when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more for joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, now he's, he's bringing it into some kind of idea. He's bringing it in. Therefore, you too now have sorrow. But I will see you again. Where's the sorrow going to come from? Death. Where's the, where, where, where is the, I'll see you again going to come from? Resurrection. When I see you again on resurrection morning... Your heart will rejoice, and no one takes your joy away from you. Where was the joy? You're going to rejoice. That's where your joy is, right? Rejoicing is the experience. Joy is the belief. Where did it come from? From not his death. That's where the sorrow and grief came from. Came from his resurrection. And uh, Al taught, uh, touched on that today. And that was true with the disciples, wasn't it? That was really true on that. So what we're looking at is this sixth, truly, truly, at the Last Supper. I mentioned to you earlier that the advantage of him going back to the Father is that he leaves the earth and goes back to heaven it becomes our advantage. 
Because when the second member leaves the earth and goes back to the heaven, the third member of the Godhead leaves heaven and comes to the earth. And we are, we are put at advantage to that because we are now capable of doing greater works. We're into a new class of vacation of ministry. I'm going to tell you where our limitations in ministry is. It's not in God. It's in our choices. When I was in my senior year of my theological training at Sanford, God put in my heart, I listened to several different men who would come and do chapel. And that senior year, there were several men that kind of had the same theme for whatever reason. Uh, at least that's my perception for me. And God spoke to my heart in my senior year that I put limitations on my ministry that I should take away. I didn't really understand that because I didn't understand what kind of limitations I was doing it. But soon as I had that enlightenment in my soul of what that, a friend of mine called me, a, a fellow pastor, and we did this all the time. Those of us that were in our senior level of study had churches, rural churches, when when we had revival time come up, we always gave it to each other so we could get extra money. <laughs> we were, you talk about a church mouse, we belong to that category. He had a church in Eden, Pell City, Eden, a small church like we all had. They paid us more than we were worth, and that wasn't much. And he said, I want you to come and do a revival for me, a three-day revival, and I said, okay. Under one condition. Otherwise, I'm not going to come. <laughs> Even spark, probably not. But he said, what? I've said, I don't care nothing about the offering. Man, I don't care about it. But I, but I was headed out of the door anyhow. I, I was headed to another ministry. I said, but what I really would like to do is I want it open-ended. I want it open-ended, which means I'll come in. But as long as people are getting saved, we're not going to quit. As long as people are being saved, you want a revival, I'm going to come in and I'm going to do it, which was an evangelism effort. As long as people get saved, we're not going to shut it down. He said, okay. And so I did it. The first day, no, we, we didn't expect any salvations. The first day, you, you know, everybody's getting used to everybody. We're playing ping pong. Second day, we had some people saved. The third day, we had something saved. He came to me and said, well, we got people saved. What? I said, well, we keep running. Until nobody, with less, no more saved than what I'm going home. I stayed, I stayed in Pell City two months. And I'm going to tell you, God shut that entire city down spiritually. We marched through the high schools, the grammar schools, the city, the churches. It was unbelievable. And I learned a great lesson. I learned a great lesson from that. I would never do anything ever again in my heart that didn't have an open end. None of this, I'm going to shut it down in three days no matter what. None of this, I'm going to shut it down in a month. No, let God open it up. If he opens the door, let him shut it. That was the message these guys kept preaching. God opens doors. How's this thing shut? 
How do you know when he shuts the door? You know when he it, opens it. How come you don't know when he shuts it? And uh, I'm going to tell you, if you're going to go into ministry and you want to see God do great and marvelous things, leave it open. I'm just saying, leave it open. Leave it open. If he's going to open the door, whatever that ministry open door is, that's the way I've ministered 44 years in this church. It's absolutely how I've ministered. I mean, I, I, and it's the way we minister all of, our, all of our ministries in this church. When the door opens, we go gun, gangbusters on it. When he shuts the door, we salute it and move to another one. I'm going to tell you that there's an enormous thought. Listen, this is part of learning what the advantage is. What is the advantage? What is, what is the advantage that we have that Christ is no longer with us on earth, but the third member of the Godhead is with us, who's directing all the affairs of our life, is he not? He's, listen, if you read Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit, it says he guides you, he teaches you, he convicts you. I mean, it's all about his ministry, and this is to our advantage. I'm just saying Somewhere in your life, reach that maturity where it's all about God. Where it's all about God. Where it's all about God. Let him open it. We all pray for an open door. Don't shut it. If he opens it, let him shut it. That would be my advice today. Let me get to point number one. I'm going to talk about three things today. I'm going to talk about, I'm talking about how grief turns into joy. How, how do you do that? How does grief get turned into joy? Like many listening to my message today, like in the day of Jesus, listening to his, they were not aware. Listen to me. Here's, here's your problem. Here's your problem. You're, you're time oriented. That's all right. Pay attention to this. I wrote this down because I think it's going to be important to us. They were not aware that they will need to apply the very lesson they're listening to that Jesus was teaching when he said in a little while that it would be in a matter of hours. It wasn't days. It wasn't years. It wasn't months. Hours. And I think... Because of that, you'd be well worth your time to listen to us today as we bring this message to you. The first thing I want you to notice, when I read through, I know you didn't pay any attention. You just read through it with me. See the word a little while? It dominates verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. I tell you, always watch your words that are dominated in passages, right? They're markers. Always pay attention to this. That little phrase, little while, which is uh, in the Greek language, uh, sometimes it has a definite article, sometimes it doesn't. Micron. A little while, a micron in the Greek language, a micron. It is used seven times. It is used two times in 16, two times in 17, one time in 18, and two times in 19. It dominates the subject. It dominates it. A little while, a little while, a little while. Repetitious teaching. Listen to me. Let me ask you a question. Was it getting through to the disciples? Yes, because they were repeating it back, weren't they? What's he mean by this a little while, a little while, a little while, a little while, right? Repetitious teaching was getting in. It was finally breaking through there. They began to use it back with one another. What is he talking about? It dominates the subject. But here's the question. Here's the question. What was it about? How was he using it? In other words, there's going to be a topic that he's pushing. A little while and what? A little while and what? A little while and what? Right? I mean, he's using this. It's a tag. It's a, a slogan 
to get you to buy a product, right? A jingle, whatever. So what is it, you see? What is it? Because if all you get is the little while and you don't get what the jingle is about, then... So what was it about? A little while and what? A little while and what? Well, have, do you know what the answer to that is? A little while, you will see me no longer. A little while, and you will not see me. And then in a little while, you will what? See me. Uh-oh. We will have a special at the close of the service. <laughs> Knowing her, she would like that. She'd go off. Of, I'll take that. So in, in Jesus, and, and here's what I find interesting. I find conversational ministry. One of the things I would have never in my life dreamed of was because I was so focused on study and teaching, I would have never, ever dreamed that I would, my, one of my great ministries in life would be conversational ministry. It is. I go to Chick-fil-A every morning in my life. If, if, if I can get through the roads. And I have conversational ministry. And it has been just beyond lights out in my life. I would have never, ever believed that to be possible. I wasn't geared that way. I didn't think that way. I didn't. But God in his marvelous grace... It gave me, and here it is right here. Jesus used it a lot. I don't know why I never saw it. I began to become aware of it in my own life. Then I saw it everywhere. I saw it with the woman at the well and with his disciples and everywhere. But there's a conversational ministry on, and here's what's going on. You got one conversation between the disciples and the disciples on what Jesus is teaching, and you've got it between Jesus and his disciples on what he's teaching, Right? So you got this going on at Bible study. Well, do you know what he's saying? I don't know what he's saying. What do you know what he's saying? I don't know. And so I find this really interesting. In verse 16, a little while, he, he introduces death and resurrection. The disciples, they, they can't figure out what he's saying. Listen to what he does in verse 17. Listen to verse 17. You're going to miss this. Look in verse 17. You're going to miss this. He goes to the ascension. He went from death, resurrection, death, re right? And, and, and he went, then he, he jumps all the way over to the ascension in verse 17. Look, you're going to miss this. Don't miss this. This is good. How do I know? Because they said, because I go to the Father. I go to the Father. Now, they don't understand that. But what he's just introduced into their life is his ascension. Die on a cross. Be buried. And listen, you won't see me, then you'll see me. He's going to do it again. You won't see me, and you'll see me. Listen, you won't see me, and you'll see me. We live in that. This is our period on earth. You don't see me, you will see me. Right? And that, me going to the Father, is where the advantage to your life is going to come to greater works and, and ministry. Please see that. Please see that. Please see that. He introduced the ascension. He's all over that. Not only has he been talking at the upper room about death, burial, but he's been talking about ascension. I'm going to the Father. It's to your advantage. Oh, this is just too good to... Then the disciples, they say, we don't know what he's talking about. And they use the word oida with a negative ook, of course, in the perfect tense. We don't know what you're talking about. You know what's just happened? It's just what Al taught in the first hour. Here's what happened. Failure to inhale, exhale the word of God. They got stalled. What? Old, old belief system. The old belief system, this is what I believe. This is what I believe about Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ, no matter what Jesus tells them, they've shut down. They've listened, listen to me, they've listened and they've learned, but they don't believe. They shut down and they inhale, exhale. And what did, what, and why? They had another belief. They had another belief. I don't know why Jesus is talking this way. He keeps talking this way and all he does is upset me. Let not your hearts be upset. Well, apparently that's not working. <laughs> Let not your hearts be, I mean, it sounds good, but nobody's, nobody's buying in on that. And then, and then Jesus comes back in the truly, truly of verse 20. Your grief will be turned to joy. Watch that. And then he gives an example. He gives a hands-on example. Birth, right? Birth. A travail pain is turned into birth joy. Travail pain is turned into birth joy. He says, therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. So he's going to go back to the Father, and they're not going to see him again until he returns. We live in this same state. This is the state in which we live. He has gone back to the Father. We will see him again. We will see him again. Here's the second point. There is a, do there is a doctrinal point to the believer, and it is you can have great joy in spite of extreme grief and sorrow, by cycling the truth of God's word by faith to your situation. I know that's a lot. You can have great joy in spite of extreme grief and sorrow. There's no way to get that. Listen, I got introduced to this subject matter when I was a little boy, about seven, eight. When my dog Brownie that I'd had from, I don't know when, I had him ever since I knew. My dog Brownie got run over right there in front of me. And I haven't been able to have a dog, personal dog, ever again. That was so traumatic in my soul, I'm not going to go through that again. I looked up and saw the life expectancy of a dog and I went, no way. No way I could have a, ever have a dog again. I know it's crazy as an adult. I just go like, how come you don't, you know, that's crazy. But I sit there and watch that. And so you can have great joy in spite of extreme grief. There was no way I could ever, ever, ever understand that. At the age of seven, I don't know that I have to. But at my age today, I need to know that. And I don't care what. I don't know what produces, it doesn't matter what produces your grief. Grief is a legitimate over extreme loss. Nothing wrong with grief. Listen to me. But at some point, you got to turn it into joy. You know the difference between grief and sorrow? Grief is the event. Sorrow is a period of adjustment. Grief is part of that when somebody dies, no matter whether it's expected or unexpected, when they die, there's grief. There's some shock. There's some, uh, you, you, it just staggers you. It's grief. Then grief in itself is going to turn to sorrow. Because when the funeral's over and all the paperwork is done, you take that deep breath, then you have to deal with sorrow. Because sorrow, death is the event of a loss. Sorrow is the adjusting to life with the loss. And you can have joy, inner peace and contentment with the circumstances 
based on the truth of God's word operating in your soul. You can go through grief on the one hand and have joy and peace. You can go through sorrow in that period of adjusting, in that period of life without that loved one, coming to the sense of what that means, and you can have joy. You can have sorrow turn to joy. You get up in the morning, you feel sorrowful, you can turn it to joy. Let me tell you how you do that. Number one, you do it instantaneously by the work of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22, 23, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Love. Joy. There it is. Your sorrow is part of the natural part of life. But you don't have to stay in the sorrow trench. You can find the joy in the sorrow. You can find the peace and contentment in the sorrow. You can do it by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. It's one of the advantages of Christ going back to the Father. That's what the disciples learned. They learned it at Pentecost. They learned it 10 days before Pentecost when he breathed his spirit upon them. They learned it 10 days earlier. I'm telling you that we have this access. You're going to go through grief. There are things and losses that grieve you. Doesn't necessarily have to be people. It can be things. And there's a period of sorrow. I'm not saying those are wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't have them. I'm saying you can flip them. You have the advantage of Christ returning to the Father and sending the Holy Spirit to our life. And the Holy Spirit can make sense out of stuff that doesn't make sense. The Holy Spirit is there to teach you and to guide you and to instruct you. And, and listen to me, and to love on you, and to love you, to minister the love of God in your heart, to minister the love of joy in your heart, in, in the most unbelievable of circumstances of your life. <clears throat> and if you've gone through some of these things, you know what I'm telling you. And if you've gone through some of them, and you haven't been able to recover from it, then this is the missing link. In a little while, in a little while, in a little while, I, I, I want you to do something on your piece of paper because I've got to quit. So I want you to get something. I want to show you something. On the back of your paper or someplace, I want you to write this down. I, uh, you, you, know, you know the symbol of the soul. You know, self-conscious, SC. That was one I wish I had a, a board. SC, I didn't know I was going to do this. SC, and then C for conscience. SC for self-consciousness. Put a C for conscience. Put an M for mentality. Put a V for volition and put an E for emotion. Now, that's the human soul. Are you with me? Self-consciousness, conscience, mentality, volition, and emotion. Now, I, want you, I want you to do that. On, the, on mentality, there's a left side and there's a right side. The left side is called the left, the left side is called the mind, and the right side is called the heart. Now, I'm going to teach you something today that you probably haven't paid attention to. On the left side, the side that's called the mind, the mind, that's where we get perception. We get perception. And on the right side, called the heart, is where we get comprehension. Okay? Now, on the, on the left side, what you have... On the left side, I want you to write the word shadow. And on the right side, that over the word mind, write shadow. And over the heart, 
right reality. Reality. Now, on the heart side, I want you to write this down. Underneath the heart side. Are you with me? Because the heart has tablets. It has functional aspects. Like, write this down. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 and 4.6. It teaches that, that the, heart has, the heart has tablets. It has divisions. And I'm going to tell you what they are. They're, that's very important. Let not your what be grieved? Let not your hearts be troubled. Yeah. Let not your hearts be troubled. On the heart side, you have a frame of reference, FR. You have a frame of reference. You have a memory center, an MC. You have a memory center. In that memory center is long-term memory and short-term memory. Right? We all have that. Right? Then you have vocabulary. Vocabulary. And the vocabulary, when it gets when vocabulary gets to the to the heart side, it's uh, it's extensive. It's it's not vocabulary like A B C D E F G. No, it's developed into into uh, words and. Um, Multi multitude of differences in that vocabulary word of meaning. You understand? It gets very complicated. The vocabulary, when I say vocabulary, I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about A, B, C, D, E. I'm talking about the complexity of the development of words and communication and all of that. Then we have your beliefs. Your beliefs, what you truly believe is in your right lobe, is in your heart. Your beliefs. This is what we would say, faith. I believe such and such. I will stake my life on it, business. And then spiritual IQ. Spiritual IQ. Now, let me tell you something. See... See the left lobe? I said it's a what? Shadow. It's a shadow of your right lobe. It's a shadow. Everything is processed through there. Everything is processed through there and run over to there. You still have this over here run on a mind scale, not a heart scale. For example, for example, there's a recall. You know, you have a frame of reference, so you can recall. I mean, how many times have you gone through this idea? I remember taking geometry, but I don't remember anything about geometry. I remember the school I went to. I remember the teacher. I remember the textbook. I remember one or two things that were really interesting. I don't remember anything else. But you, you see, you have recall, you have a frame of reference, and all of that's on the perceptive side. All of that's on the perceptive side. Now, if geography, you may come back to that, you may come back to that in some place in business, in some kind of profession, you go like, wow, I've got to have geometry. I got to have algebra. I'm an engineer. And then you go back and you relearn. And it becomes an operational aspect of your whole system. It's transferred over to the heart. Maybe in your life you can remember cir certain circumstances. Or maybe you got, I'm bad on names, but I'm good on faces. Where does that come from? It comes from the shadow. It comes from the shadow concept. It comes from the mind. And the mind shadows the heart. It, 
it works because it's all part of the same network. And I think it's important that you understand that. It's important that you understand this stuff. Because I go, well, I, I think I must have, how is it possible that one person does this and the other person? This is how it works. And when we talk about this, as Al did this morning, when we talk about that, you must, you must, listen, there's a good reason why the Bible says you must walk by faith and not by sight. For example, for the disciples, sight would be that he died, was buried, and now we have an empty tomb, and we believe somebody stole the body. Where did that come from? It didn't come from the Word of God. Jesus himself said, in three days I'll be raised from the dead, as Jonah was three days and three nights. So where did this idea come from? It came from what we call sight. Had they sat in classes? Did they sit in Bible classes when Jesus told them how it was going to be? Yes. Did they hear him? Yes. Did they believe him? Yes. D listen to me. Did they have a shadow of understanding? Yes. Did they have a belief about it? No. When did they remember? When he was raised from the dead, for, for, for example, when the rooster crowed, Peter got that part of it, didn't get the rest of it. It was in the shadow. It wasn't in the content. When he heard the rooster crowed, then it, the, it reminded him because the rooster was in his right lobe, not the information. When he did, then he was able to cycle it over. He was able to believe. And so the rest of the disciples... Rather than believe that he was raised from the dead on the third day, as he said, what is going on in these guys' life? Well, John, the second chapter, 222, and when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said, and they believed. Where did they remember? Where did that come from? Didn't come from the right lobe, came from the left, came from his mind, the shadow. And then it was transferred over by, belief, by faith. Be careful in your life that you don't walk by sight, that you walk by faith. And what is the great test of whether I'm by sight? Check it out with the Word of God. Thoroughly examine that by the Word of God. What does the Bible say? And did you study all that the Bible has to say about it? Well, there's more for you to study. I'm telling you, it's not that you go through grief, it's that you're able to turn it over to joy. It's not that you don't go through sorrow, it's that you go through sorrow and can turn it into joy. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. That's how this thing works. Let us pray. Then we'll do our pledge, Rick. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this today. Father, we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our life. Let not your hearts be troubled. Is that one of those things, Father, that sounds good and impossible? The disciples kept listening to the Word of God and saying, well, that sounds good, but that's impossible. That's impossible. That's impossible. That's impossible. How was that impossible? It was due to their belief system. Not the way they heard the, by the word of God. It's what they did with it once they heard it. Just stored it in the right lobe, in the left lobe, and never the right. I pray that be not us. Not that the world says it goes in one ear and out the other. That's not how we learn to live the Christian life. Not in one word, in our ear and out the other. Pray, Father, you'd correct that idea in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.